session of Irish History from the Hedgerow at the Irish Roots Cafe, produced by irishroots.com, with Peter Riley Adams and Michael O'Laughlin. Find a spot on the warm, sunny side of the Hedgerow now. Today's session is about to begin. They were rough, unpolished men, brilliant scholars, teaching by the side of the road, in small rooms, in nooks and crannies, wherever and whenever possible. Such men as these, they were the teachers of the hedge. Oh, then tell me, Sean O'Farrell, tell me why you hurry so. Hush away, just hush and listen, and his cheeks were all aglow. I bear orders from the captain, get ye ready, quick and soon. For the pikes must be together at the rising of the moon. All along that singing river that black mass of men was seen. High above their shining weapons flew their own beloved green. Death to every foe and traitor whistle out the marching tune. And a thousand pikes were marching by the rising of the moon. The rising of the moon. We're going to talk today, students, about the 1700s. So find your nice seat there along the hedge row, right on a piece of uh, turf. Get yourself ready. We'll make an analogy here. The 17th century was a very interesting century. Um, we do the song there, The Rising of the Moon. But remember, the moon comes at night when things sometimes get dark. What we like to talk about is the other part of the 17th century, or 1700s rather, which also seems to give us a rising of the sun. There was great daylight in Ireland, in a sense, all across. Um, the 1700s started with Queen Anne, still on the throne of England, and Anne, of course, uh, had taken it over from her brother-in-law and sister, William and Mary, but she was uh, also uh, an, a direct heir from Ch James II. And when uh, Anne died in 1702, uh, and she, by the way, uh, kind of a, a, an odd thing, she was called the last Queen of England and Scotland. We obviously know there is a queen today, but... That's because of the Act of Union, uh, she became the Queen of Great Britain, or well, the, the monarchy became of Great Britain, not, not just uh, the, um, England and Scotland. It became one single sovereign state. So she dies, and uh, it was the last of the House of Stuart, and she was succeeded by her cousin, George. And so we enter into the Georgian era which uh, has a lot of different things. And we have three Georges in the 1700s. But uh, George was the grandson of Elizabeth, who was the daughter of James I, and his mother was Sophia. And um, Sophia was to become the, the, uh, the queen, but she died just before Anne died. So that's when it went to George. And it's George I, who, by the way, his first language was German, uh, and he was born in Germany uh, in the house of Hanover. So and, would you would you say that the uh, when you're watching television and you see all those movies on the English and and the uh, King George and they talk about America and he has that great English accent, would you say he developed that accent or that was a complete lie? Well, actually, by the time they got to the third mm -hmm. George, right, he was born in England. Oh, and he, his father was born in Germany, and his father was made a, a, a citizen. Uh, they weren't even citizens of England, but they were still heirs. By the time you get to George the Third, he did speak English. He's the first of the Georges, as English was not his second language. It was his first. Oh, very good. Yeah, the other two Georges, German. Oh, we never think of that, yeah. do we? And in fact, the, the whole thing, uh, you know, it moves on uh, uh, in the historical notion, George. George the Third was the grandfather of Victoria. Victoria is of the house of saxe coburn gotha German name. And World War I, it's when they dropped that name and took Windsor because there was some problems between the Germans and the English, obviously, it was called a war, but that's on. So at any rate, it's a great period. Um, George II then became uh, king in 1727 to 1760, uh, and his really is the Georgian era. Think of the things that were going on. 
All right, we had the battle. We talked about the battle of 1798, which we'll conclude with. But uh, we started with the, the rising of the moon, and that is all about the battle when things had moved. But this was a period when the Protestant ascendancy started to really dominate. And they were also suffering from some of the legislation passed in England to cause Ireland not to have the same freedoms as they would in England. So as they rose up and the, those uh, uh, restrictions were really being put on the Catholics, but it was in other ways affecting the Protestants, they were thinking, wait a minute, we're being affected by this in ways that are detrimental to our economic growth. There's the key, economics. They, uh, For instance, um, you could raise cattle and sheep, but they were not enforcing the use of tillage, that you couldn't be farming. Now, what did they do with farm? Well, farming you could sell, you could trade, you could uh, export it. Uh, but then they put laws on where you couldn't export things from Ireland. Well, if the Protestants owned the land, and some of them who were still living in England, for instance, were getting rental taxes, they couldn't get their money because they couldn't sell it anywhere else. And so it became economic problems that they needed to uh, needed to overcome in order so everybody could become prosperous on the English side, the Protestant Irish and on the English. Well, and you know, that's uh, one one reason why they were so upset in the later years of that century. The English were selling their things just fine in Ireland, but it was not a two-way street. It was not free trade, and that uh, that's the that made things even worse. <clears throat> there was no free trade. There was no uh, give and take, quid pro quo. There wasn't, it wasn't there. One wasn't getting from the other. The other part in the century, you know, there were two famines, that, in yes. Ireland in the 1700s. And this was in the period of George II. There was a famine from 1728 uh, to 29 where the oat crop failed and uh, thousands were killed. Also in 1740 to 1741, there was a terrible winter. Yeah, I saw numbers like 400,000 people yeah, 200 died. 200,000 to 400,000. That's, that's yes. a, um, it's amazing. We sit here today, and uh, we have no idea of this kind of disaster. No, not at all. And, and, and especially if you think of the size of Ireland. I mean, mm. in land mass, you know, where you could grow, where you couldn't, in the cities and the farms, etc., or the, the towns of the time. There was a potato shortage, uh, and because of the winter, it froze. So, the, because they kept it outside, and so they weren't. And then there was also another oak crop failure. And so, you, there's a couple of things. Then you had a, a bank failure in 1733. And the famine in 1740 caused bread riots in Dublin. Yes. And all of this is good. But in Ireland, rather, uh, was, of course, still uh, under England, as we know. But also, they had a parliament. But that parliament had to listen to what the British Parliament... So the Irish Parliament could pass laws and they could establish for themselves because they're living in the condition. If you're there, you know better what's happening than somebody who isn't there who may just hear from it to get reports. So the Protestant ascendancy who had their own parliament was saying, wait a minute, we need to be free to make decisions without having to make a decision, send it over to England and let them decide if what we decided was okay, or England make a decision and send it over to us telling us that we have to live by that when we know very well that it's not good for us to have to listen to these laws that were pushed on. Well, you know, at talking about laws, let's take a quick look before we move on to the rest of the century. But if you look at that, uh, you know, the penal laws, which uh, 1695 was a bad time for that. But 1704, they extended it and they made those laws even worse. And really, it's, it's aimed at uh, wiping out the Catholic Irish at least the religion, the Irish could stay if they converted, but right. uh, you could not own land, you could not inherit land. Well, the inheritance was, was is kind of an interesting thing. If uh, Catholics uh, tended to have more children, yes. So, so I I have five sons, and I die, and I have uh, ten acres of land. Well, I could only give that to my uh, well, I could give it to all my sons, but I had to divide it. Yes. Now, if I became Protestant, then it could be done properly. Well, if you became Protestant, you got all the son who became Protestant got, got all, all the all land, the land. and they, the it land. was a nice thing. They had a rule where it, you could make your parent tenant for life, 
and uh, obtain ownership of the land by converting. Would that not have been a nice thing to see? And once again, it's, you know, what what are your principles? What are you going to give up for the sake of? And the English were doing it so that the Irish could not obtain any kind of influence because of any kind of wealth. Yes, and and those, uh, you think about it, you've got these plots being divi- subdivided and subdivided. Each person had to pay pay more rent to the landlord in total, and uh, uh, each person had a very small lot, which would play a part in these famines, too, because they couldn't raise enough food to live on. That's right. You couldn't raise enough food in order to support yourself. And in the tillage, you had to grow the crop, sell the crop, so that you could pay the rent while keeping some of the crop so that you could survive. And what did they say that the people, how did they live back then? The the peasants, the majority of the peasants, I don't know how they rose up into some kind of mercantile class, which they did, but they say the majority of these folks were in windowless mud cabins and they were lucky to have a bed and a table and the animals had to live inside with them or they disappear because people were starving. Well, you know, in, in, um, in Bunratty, in Clare right now, they have examples of houses. It's called a folk park, but if you walk through there, they have uh, they have a little village there, which is kind of a modern yes. thing, probably in the 20s or 30s. But if you go down the lane on the way towards the castle, there are examples of how the cottages were understood to have been during these centuries, especially in the 17th, some in the 16th, but more the 17th and 18th. And you go in, and there are no windows, and it's a dirt floor, and there's a, a small... Uh, a uh, fireplace to burn the peat, and there might be a chair or a table, but there's nothing else, and there's a mat on the floor. But an interesting thing that happened is that the population of Ireland doubled. Yes, how? <laughs> was it from two to five or two to four? Yeah, it was like from two million to five million, in, in roughly. In a hundred years. Yes. So that's also kind of amazing that this kind of thing would happen. Uh, but the other thing with animals... This can be Ireland is never really that cold, just damp. But one of the interesting things with animals in the in the uh, if you go back to the biblical stories of where there were there was no room in the inn, yeah, but and he was born in a stable. Well, yeah, the stable was underneath, and the stables were underneath because the animals would be down there. Obviously, they could be let in and out easily, but the warmth of the body heat of the animal would help keep the rest of the building warm. Oh, yeah, heat rises, and so the animals there. They had a, another uh, function in the sense that they helped keep people warm, uh, which is just kind of a, how, how things grew today. We don't understand such things. Uh, we don't get that much warm from our cat or our dog. But, you know, if you bring the horse and the cows and uh, everybody else in. Well, and, uh, and to say nothing of the aroma that you benefit oh, it's from. lovely. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Today yes. you have to buy those little spray things to make beautiful aroma. They had it built in, uh, built in. So what you have in here is uh, in in Ireland at the time, all sorts of things are happening. Uh, but while there was this uh, the difficulties, there was also a great growth in architecture. Yeah, Dublin Castle was built at this time in George II. the second. the uh, the The castle, uh, the four courts were built. Trinity College, and if you've been in Dublin and look at these magnificent buildings, this is when it occurred. If you go down the streets and they talk about the colored doors of Dublin, those are all houses built during this period, the Georgian era, and then, of course, the Georgian style. But uh, there was tremendous growth, and a lot of it, of course, the Protestant ascendancy. And then there was no risings uh, in the early part, most of the part, until the very end of the century, yes. there was no rebellion. So it's said that the uh, the Protestants, even the ascendancy, uh, and even, even with the penal laws being on the Catholics, became rather, um, oh, say, they, they were more comfortable with people being Catholic. And because there were no risings, there was less of a threat, which had been terribly put on them in the Cromwellian times and the Williamite Wars. You know, this great threat, the Catholics are going to murder you. Well, that wasn't happening at this time. There was a settlement of things. People were calming down and and living life, even though the penal laws were there and that uh, you and I have discussed, Michael, that there, there was a price on the priest's head. And we went through over and over again. But then after a while, it was like, oh, that's okay that they're going to Mass. It's okay that they're doing There came to be an acceptance of the other style. And the real battles that started coming, even though there's some mention about the Catholics in it, the Protestants were the one who were saying to England, hey, 
We want the same status here in Ireland. We're Protestants. We're members of Parliament. We're the people who are keeping this going. We want the same status in Ireland as you have in England. We want to be independent. We want a Protestant government, but we want to have the same freedoms that the rest of the empire has. Well, and what in the world was making that happen that just added flames to the fire? Well, the America... The revolution in America, and even more so, closer to home, the French Revolution. Right right next door, so to speak. And, uh, of course, there was a great... Remember that uh, Charles, uh, the king, his wife, when Charles lost his head, his wife went to France because mm-hmm. she was Louis, Louis XIII's daughter. Right. So the Irish and the English, they're all kind of related, and the Irish would go... To France. And all, what about all the wild geese? 30,000 people at the end of the France. Seven, 1600s? France, of France. And yes. support was coming from France, which uh, the French support wasn't necessarily pro-Irish as much it was anti-English. Yes. And and they wanted to... Uh, well, when the Irish went there, of course, then they were starting to learn things. And it is known uh, philosophically, historically, the period of the Enlightenment, the great writers. you know. And in Ireland, you had Jonathan, Jonathan Swift... You had Edmund Burke, who everybody says is English. He's actually Irish. They were seeing things. They were writing things. They were, they were Protestants being educated and then looking at the, the terrible conditions that existed with some of these people. They wanted to enhance everybody. They, if you pull one up, you pull them all up. Yes, and, and, and if you look at the... Uh just before this happens, you take a look at the writings of the people that had come from France and some of the English. They describe the Irish. What do they say about them? These peasants who had lost their lands and had lost all hope except for maybe a few in the cities in this rising mercantile class that I still haven't figured out completely. But it said that they were very hospitable and still generous, but they were great gamblers and superstitious and lovers of music and dance. And they were very conservative, but very curious. Now, how does how do those two things go together? Well, you mean the curiosity and the, and, and the conservative? Growth? Yes. Well, they were holding on to their own values, and that value was being Catholic, and of course being Irish. Uh, you were asking about uh, conservatism and, and curiosity. I think the conservatism is obviously the Irish uh, wanting to maintain the value system that they had as Catholics and their identity that they had as Irish. Uh, their curiosity was coming from all of the other things that were happening in the world. You mentioned uh, France and, of course, the, the great relationship that appeared to be between the French and the Irish over long periods of the French aiding in any other risings in the early parts uh, of the uh, late parts of the other century, early parts of the century we're talking about now, uh, the wild geese uh, going and going to France. Uh, even at the end of this uh, century, Napoleon was going to help uh, uh, Theobald Wolftone. The Irish would have a curiosity in what is going on in the world that this whole issue of I matter as a person uh, the Enlightenment period. Uh, we're worth it. I, I also read about a woman who arrived in, in Ireland and saw the poverty, and she said, I have never seen such desperate poverty as I saw in Ireland in coming. So there was this notion uh, in other places that there was a care, and the Irish were seeing this of other people and thinking, why are they so interested? And it's because of what was happening, the growth of uh, of issues of human rights. You mentioned that there was a French Revolution. Of course, the American Revolution came first. uh, And when the trade thing opened up, the uh, the Irish could then trade with the colonies. So they could always, uh, well, the English and Scots could trade with Canada. Uh, Now that they could trade with the colonies, it was opened up. You could do some things within the Republic, with the the Empire, but not uh, outside. But here you got into the, with the uh, North American colonies, and they were able to uh, do some trading. Plus, what's happening in the American colonies, the same thing, rebellion against the British. The British were almost being bombarded on every side. Yes, uh, and the, and the uh, troops were being pulled out of Ireland to be used in America, in America. which which changed That's things right. politically, didn't it? Sure. Oh, absolutely. Because the, the troops also discovered that they could find out about this uh, this new approach to what it means to be free, this new approach to government, this new approach to life, and... 
You know, uh, the, the the George Washington member was uh, was a colonel in the British Army. <laughs> well, and the and the British started making concessions to the Irish because they were in a weaker position. Their forces right. were being used elsewhere. That's right. And and when uh, the Irish in the famine, uh, the two periods of famine um, in uh, the seventeen hundreds, seventeen forties, the Irish also went to America. Yes. Uh, you see, so that they were understanding two sides. It was still uh, English control, so they were able to go and they went. And this started causing, you know, people start talking. The more that there are and the more you hear and the more you learn, the more you start to think. There's your curiosity. Yeah, and the Presbyterians, they still weren't the official uh, uh, church and state uh, thing going on with England. They weren't the established church, so they were being discriminated against, and they were leaving for America. And as we've said so many times before, they were the Scots-Irish that uh, we right. know so well today, that yes. name. And, the, and then eventually the, the, uh, the, the, the throne and the British started letting the Presbyterians alone. So, well, wait a minute. They also thought to say, we better regroup here. Because other things are happening to us so far away, we want to at least hold those things which are close to us. The other thing that was happening is that the parliament was becoming much stronger. Uh, The king was giving up certain rights, but he still had a veto. And he saw some things. And apparently, and remember, that we have our kings who are Germans. And they're looking at some things and going, what? What's going on? Why is this? Yes, they wanted to protect the throne. They were protecting their own legacy. But uh, they also had different concerns. Well, this causes a whole new thought, a whole new growth of things. Uh, oh, you know, another thing that happened, which to me, when I mentioned that the, uh, those great architectural buildings, do you know there were art houses or playhouses opened in Galway and in Limerick and in Cork? So the arts and Handel's Messiah was performed in the very first performance conducted by Handel himself in Dublin. No, I had not known that. Yes. So, you see, there is this exchange in this, wait a minute, that's not this barbarian thing on the other side of the water there. It too, and as the Protestant culture was growing, well, they wanted to be a part of the English culture. And actually, you find at this period that the Protestants, uh, in, in terms of leadership, also became a great part of the rebellion. Well, you know, I've seen that since the Irish couldn't really invest in real estate in Ireland, they couldn't own much of anything, they started sending their money abroad to the continent. And because of that, uh, they thought about loosening up the laws of, of land ownership later in the century because they were losing all their wealth and they wanted the money to go back into Ireland. And that's something people don't think about well, very much. But they much. were also becoming merchants. Yes, the Catholics were. Right. They're becoming merchants now. And the middle class was being established. Mm-hmm. Oh, you had the the aristocrats. But then you had this next group who happened to be Catholic, too, who were the, the, the storekeepers. You know, they, they weren't the owners of all the things, but they were the one in the middle, the middleman, the middle class. So you have your poor, you have your rich. And as the middle class grew... They also, and there was also Protestants, and that's when demand started to be made about trade, about economic justice, about what I can do. What, and they actually, be, some of them became wealthy, you know, oh, actually oh, started yes. to accumulate great amounts of, of money, even though they couldn't have uh, the great amount of land. But then the penal laws started to be retracted, and they realized, wait a minute, this, for the growth of everybody, th- there's a whole notion, if England, if England wants some... Um, you know, if England wants to be great, uh, well, they can't. They can either decide Ireland to build itself up, or to be completely paid for by England so it can build up. Well, which one are you going to do? Are you going to give and give until they get built up, or are you going to enable them to build themselves up so that both of us rise up? Is that whole notion of who can help who here? And at this period, I, I think that uh, that's what's happening. And look what happened towards the end of the century. Uh, Trinity College was opened up to Catholics for the first time in so many years. But well, remember, uh, you had to university. get permission from the Catholic bishop to go. Yeah, oh, yes. You were, you were permitted to attend now, which you hadn't been before. But if you wanted to go, you better get permission of the bishop. Sometimes you could, and sometimes you couldn't. Hey, and how about that seminary that they allowed him to establish in Maynooth? For Catholics in 1795, yeah, that Patrick's was a big deal. Yeah. And uh, Maynooth, I know Irish priests in the United States today who have been educated in Maynooth. 
that to me, it seems, and I, I don't know if, I don't have the numbers, but I would, I would go out on the limb to say Maynooth uh, Seminary, St. Patrick's Seminary, uh, which is also a college, you know, not just, I mean, it wasn't just a seminary, it was also a college. Uh, it was, um, it produced more priests, educated more priests uh, for the world uh, in the 18 and 1900s than anybody, any other uh, seminary in the world. And if you start to look now, you know, we talked about in our uh, uh, later episodes, if you listen to some of those, we talked about the treaty and the anti-treaty elements uh, in Irish society, and that formed their political system. Well, if you take a look now at what's happening after this whole century starts to come to an end, you've got two philosophies here. How can we solve this terrible problem? And on one hand, people would start to say, Let's separate ourselves completely from Britain again and rebel. But others would say, let's become part of Britain and ensure, become full citizens and have equal rights and equal trade. And that's what really turned things, uh, turned things around to another whole new view. And it's been, it's been smoldering secretly, perhaps, for the whole century. How did that come about? Well, the other interesting thing, um, in 1782... The Parliament in Ireland became independent. They were allowed to create their own laws for Ireland. Previously, everything came from across the wave there. Parliament in London, London, Westminster, they made all the decisions. In the Poynings Act, you could, you could make laws in Ireland, but it had to be approved in, in London. So laws could be made now in Dublin, in the Parliament, uh, by the way, that's the old, it's the Bank of Ireland building in uh, right across the street from Trinity College where that building is. Uh, you could now make laws in there, um, in Ireland, for Ireland, without the consent of the, the British Parliament. The only other thing that you dealt with was the king. It could go directly to the king. And George was apparently, you know, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> he, was, he had too many other worries to worry about what they were doing in the Parliament. 1882, an interesting year. What was happening in the world? What was George dealing with? You know, 17, or rather 17, not 18, 1783, you know, the Treaty of Paris. You've got all of the things that you're dealing with uh, and what England's dealing with. But that lasted only until 1801 when you had the Great Act of Union where it became Ireland, uh, became England, Scotland, and Ireland. It all became uh, the United Kingdom. Well, and I think... Uh... In our second segment on the 17th century, which is coming up right after this, we're going to talk about what actually happened with that rebellion and some of the details in it and uh, talk a little bit about Wolf Tone and Napper Tandy. He was a son of a Catholic merchant, and he had risen, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this has been an inter interesting century, and they talk about it, the hidden Ireland in this century where nobody really saw what was going on beneath the surface, and a lot of interesting things happened. Uh, we'll finish it up in the next, next segment. Uh, Peter, uh, I'm giving it off to you. Well, I, I just think that th this century was really phenomenal because it showed other growth. It showed that the Irish, uh, when given proper, uh, uh, even not given proper, but when they when they had the opportunities without impediment from the from England, they could grow and prosper wonderfully. The population grew. The, there was uh, merchant killism growing. There were the, the economics were growing. It, still, under the uh, under natural uh, uh, devastations of famine and uh, weather and bad winters, but the Irish had the capacity to improve themselves without the aid of Mother England. Mother England just had to recognize it. It was a great century for growth. It was a great century for understanding, a great century for enlightenment on both parts. And of course, we'll see at the end of the century, there was a final rebellion. And then we go into the 1800s, where actually there was devastating things that happened, but they were never military, is mostly a natural phenomenon. So ends this chapter of Irish history from the hedgerow. <laughs> 